Today, my guest on the show is Belinda Tay, a young woman who walks her talk. A WA law student, after losing her mother to terminal breast cancer in 2016, took the initiative to campaign for the legislation of voluntary assisted dying in Western Australia. On May 28, 2019, in support of the cause, Belinda walked from Melbourne Parliament to the West Australian Parliament House in 70 days, four and a half thousand kilometers and three million steps. On December 10, 2019, the Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill was voted into legislation in WA. Hello, darling, and welcome to the show. Hello, darling. Thanks for having me. Hi, Belinda. First of all, congratulations on everything. But what I want to congratulate you on is to being the recipient of the 2020 Momentum Visionary Woman of the Year Award. Wow. How does it feel? Um, I'm quite overwhelmed and very humbled, um, very grateful. And thank you so much for um, this incredible opportunity and honour. Yeah, I'm quite speechless about the whole thing. I'm just going to remind the viewers very briefly what the Visionary Woman of the Year stands for. Visionary Woman is the one who is ahead of their time and who has the passion and persistence to influence a positive change in the world. Well, I think we have something to talk about. about Tell us about your vision and about your brave walk. Thank you. Um, I guess my vision at this point in time is really quite simple. Um, my vision for the future for, in, for the country that I live in, uh, the country I grew up in, Australia. Um, my vision is that all Australians will have access to the same compassionate end of life choices, no matter which state you live in, no matter which territory you live in. Um, and I think the work that I did last year, the walk that I did last year, I hope that that's made a contribution in allowing us all to get that as a country, to be able to work towards that vision that I have. Um, I, think, I think that's sort of, that's sort of my, my big vision, I think, for the future. Um, there's so many things that all of us as individuals want to see in terms of the changes we would like to see happen in the world, but I think that's something that I feel very called to. Beautiful. Belinda, could you take our viewers back to when it all started, where the Brave Walk journey began and how? Sure. Well, it all started um, with my mum. It's quite simple. Um, I'm sure that you and, and many of the people watching would understand that, you know, we grew up with our mothers. They are probably the most um, influential people in our lives for so many of us. And that was the same for my mum. Um, she was a single mum growing up. Um, it was just me, uh, me and my brother and her at home. And uh, yeah, I, I watched her really carefully how she lived her life and took on a lot of the, the personality traits that she showed me as I was growing up. Um, being independent, um, always being honest, trying to help people where you can. Um, so really it started a lot a lot before she actually got sick. It started with her sort of sharing with me her beliefs and values, um, which definitely came out during the walk. But um, I think the tipping point was when um, she was suddenly diagnosed with terminal breast cancer. That was in 2016. Um, eight days before she was diagnosed, I had just finished my law degree at UWA. So it was not what I was expecting to happen as a, as a fresh graduate. So instead of becoming a lawyer or you know, pursuing a career in the legal industry, I became a full-time carer for someone who was dying at the age of 23. So that was challenging. Um, and from there, things happened very, very quickly. Um, she was diagnosed with stage four terminal, triple negative, aggressive breast cancer. Mm. And the oncologist, after taking some tests, told us, okay, uh, so two different ways it could go. If your mother responds well to chemotherapy, she will live up to three years, but no longer. If she doesn't respond well to chemotherapy, she will live um, less than 12 months. So that was the prognosis mm. from um, after we had the MRI done. Uh, at this point, my mum was in a lot of pain. Mm. She was already very, very sick. So um, we later found out bit by bit that the cancer had started in her breast and it had metastasized or spread all over her skeleton through the bone marrow. And a tumor had started growing 
in a secondary position in her spine. And that meant that there was a tumour between two vertebrae and the tumour got so big that it fractured her spine in two places. So she couldn't walk, she was in a wheelchair, um, she couldn't roll over in bed without screaming, she had cancer pain and then she had chemotherapy, her hair was falling out, she would scream and cry and vomit and I don't want to go into it too much because um, yeah, it's, it's so traumatic and, and, and so awful to talk about, but it did happen. Um, and it got to a point where mum was getting so much chemotherapy and the doctors were doing everything they could. She had amazing palliative care. Um, but unfortunately, the oncologist came in after several weeks of chemotherapy and told us that um, chemotherapy wasn't working. It was actually making her die faster and um, that they were going to stop treatment because it was no longer in her interests. And uh, that he said, I'm so sorry, Maria, but you have in the order of weeks left to live. Mm. And I was sitting there watching my mum. I had been there through every single day of her journey, every single step. And uh, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. And so I just sat there. And the first thing my mum said was, doctor, can you help me to go quicker? And my mum was, a nurse for her whole life, 39 years. She yeah. worked as, as a nurse, um, a lifelong Catholic. I grew up going to church with her. Um, and I think it's no secret the way that leaders in the Catholic church feel about these kinds yeah. of questions. And so I was completely flabbergasted. Immediately the doctor said, I'm so sorry, Maria, but what you're asking me to do, I cannot do for you. Mm -hmm. You know that, it's mm -hmm. illegal. Uh, this is in 2016 in Western Australia. This happened in a, um, in a hospital in Perth, in the Perth metro area. And um, so mum accepted that. Three days later, I thought mum had forgotten all about it. You know, we're putting things in place, getting ready for her to die. And um, her palliative care consultant came to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. And uh, he comes to say goodbye and she said, well, doctor, what about you? Can you help me to go quicker? Can you help me to speed up this process? And he gave her the same answer. No, I'm so sorry, I can't do that. And um, so she asked twice for medical assistance to die peacefully, which was refused twice. And uh, a few weeks later, I watched mum die in terrible, terrible pain and suffering. Um, yeah, it was, uh, there's, I mean, there's a lot of information online if people really want to go into the yes. details of that, I don't, I don't wish to traumatise anyone or you know um, make this a discussion that focuses in on how bad it was, but it was very bad. And uh, after that, I realised that the option that my mum was asking for had become legal in Victoria on the other side of the country where Melbourne's the capital of Victoria. Um, and so that was the moment that I realised just how unfair that was. The fact that my mum couldn't die a peaceful death because she was three and a half thousand kilometres too far away and she had died three years too early. So Belinda, my question I had is almost redundant, but at the moment when your mum said, can you make, can you help me to go quicker? And mm. she asked doctors twice. Mm -hmm. Were you supportive of this decision then? It's hard to say. Um, at that time when she asked, I don't, I mean, my position was I was supporters of, of my mum's choices, of yeah. her wishes, um, that I was there to support anything that she wanted within my power to give it to her. But because the law was limiting what she could and couldn't have, yeah. it was very difficult to support her. Mm. I mean, how are you supposed to support your mother doing something illegal? You know? But morally, I know not the execution of the law, but her mm -hmm. wishes as such. W w w how did it feel to you the first moment you had it? You know, yeah. mom, don't ask for it. Mom, I understand you ask. Mom, mm. don't go yet. Mom, suffer longer. Yeah, yeah. You know where I'm yeah. coming from. Um, I think it, there was lots of emotions at once. It's difficult for me to give a single answer because it was a complex feeling. On one hand, um, I didn't want my mom to leave me too early or earlier than, you know, that would naturally happen. On the other hand, and this is something I understood later, but I also understood at that point, um, sometimes you have to love someone enough to let them go. And so I could tell she was suffering. She was crying out for help and watching someone so helpless, so clearly expressing what they wanted and not being able to have it and being thwarted again and again. I wanted to give that to her, but I knew that we had to operate within the confines of the law. 
Um, and so after that, the solution became, well, change the law then. I must not forget I'm speaking to the lawyer because <laughs> you keep bringing law. I'm coming yeah. from the emotional side all the time, but yeah. of course, as a graduate. And how did you get the ball rolling? How, whom did you approach first sure. for help? Um, well, thanks to just this um, really amazing community that we have in Western Australia, I found myself in contact with Go Gentle Australia. Uh, Andrew and, Denton. Yes, that's right. So it's uh, Andrew Denton's charity that he founded and the goal of the charity is to um, improve the conversation around end of life choices in Australia. And um, I told them about the idea. Uh, they were very supportive and they offered uh, very generously logistical support um, throughout the whole thing. And I, I, I couldn't have done it without them. And so that really got the ball rolling because, um, you know, they organized uh, a support vehicle. Um, they paid for all my meals while I was walking, um, gave me support with, you know, helping to speak to journalists and, and the media about, about my walk. And um, I honestly couldn't have done it without them. Do you remember your first step? How I did do. it feel? Uh, it was very scary because I had never hung out with journalists or TV cameras or anything like that before. Um, I mean, I was a waitress the whole time I was studying at UWA, sure so good. it was very outside of my previous work experience. Um, and the Premier of Victoria, uh, Premier Daniel Andrews, he was kind enough to uh, help me to launch the walk. So I stood on the steps of Parliament House in Melbourne and he showed up with uh, the health minister, uh, Jenny McCarkos, and um, the uh, state attorney general, Jill Hennessy. And so I had, and uh, also Fiona Patton, the leader of the Reason Party. So I had this amazing um, group of people sending me off. And so how was the first step? It was very full on because um, Channel 7, Channel 10, like all of the, the major news stations came with their cameras and it was all very overwhelming. But I think I didn't have time to feel scared or think about it. All I could think about was my mum and making sure that everything that I did from that step forwards, um, I had to remain focused on her. Otherwise, it's, it gets too distracting. Biggest challenges on your, on, your, on your three million steps journey, what was your biggest obstacle you know, on, this, on this walk? The biggest obstacle on the walk was doing it without my mum. The physical aspect of the walk was easy. Mm -hmm. I had so much support. I could rest when I wanted to rest. That was the beauty of it. It wasn't like a full on hardcore physical thing where, you know, I crawl over the finish line every day. I did it at my own pace, um, took breaks when I wanted to. The physical aspect of the walk was easy in comparison. Um, mentally and emotionally, it was very challenging. Um, I was very lucky to have the support of my partner, support of many family, friends, supporters. Your husband. My husband, yes, yes. that's right. Um, very, I'm a very lucky woman. Um, he was very, very supportive throughout the whole thing. He drove the support vehicle behind me. And he's French. He is. So he cooked French meals for you. <laughs> he did. <laughs> so oh. it was, you know, it could have been worse. It could have been a lot worse. Um, he took very good care of me. But um, the, the thing that nobody could help me with was the fact that I missed my mum. I mean, when you're struggling, let's say, you know, if you're a new mum going through pregnancy and birth, if you're um, a young graduate going through your first job, um, I don't know, in, in, the, in the corporate world, what do you do at the end of a long day at work at the, at the end of, you know, when you're stressing out with your baby or, you know, looking after your kids, you call your mum and I couldn't do that. Absolutely. And I'd never tried, I'd never attempted something so challenging in my life and not being able to call her at the end of every day, that yes. was the hardest part. Uh, Belinda, do you plan to campaign on any uh, important global issues in the forthcoming future? <sighs> global issues in the forthcoming future. Or do you intend to continue campaigning for the, for the law to be passed, you know, Australia-wide? Um, I think that the willingness of Australians to push for this change nationwide, I don't think that's going to go away, no matter mm. what. Um, I think that all of the statistics, the polling, no matter who's polling, it always shows that Australians aren't going to rest until the same compassionate choices are available across the country. Um, we now know that voluntary assisted dying is available in Victoria. It will be um, available very soon in, in Western Australia, well, next year. Um, and so will I continue campaigning for it? Yes, for as long as, as, long as I possibly can. Um, and hopefully 
within my time, I'll see I'll see a situation where we will, we will get there. As for other causes, I think it's up to every individual to really listen in and 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 sense what they're being called to advocate for. I think that we're all politicians in, in a way. Um, we're not all parliamentarians, but we're all politicians in a sense that if we see a need in the community, it's our job to speak up. Um, and so I don't know. I don't know what that could be for me in the future. Um, but I think it's been a really good learning experience um, with voluntary assistance. Which brings me to, in 2019, you spoke at TED Talk and it was incredible Thank you. address you, you delivered. And of course, your topic was a social... Social courage. Social courage. Yes. Now, we know why social courage is so important to you mm -hmm. and your mom who showed the social courage herself. Mm -hmm. The whole journey, if you would have to say, how did it change you as a young girl who obviously was living the dream, becoming a lawyer? How did it change your view on life, social courage? And mm -hmm. that's where I want to also bring something. Do you think the social courage, you spoke about it on a TED talk, relates to very, very big issue in today's world, which is social respect? Um, so do I think that social courage... Connection. Yeah, so because I mean, in my TED talk, I said, you know, social courage is when you speak up and you risk losing yeah. something socially because what you need to say yeah. is too important. Um, and so you, you're asking about social respect. Yes, respect for each other, respect to each other. Yeah. So I think social courage and respecting other people, um, they definitely can go in hand in hand. If you feel that there is something that you really have to say, mm even though you're going to upset someone else, there's still a way for you to communicate that without disrespecting other people. And that's what I've always strived to do. So yes, they are related. Um, and I think what we need more of in today's society are um, people who um, can communicate and be socially courageous, communicate these ideas that are sometimes very difficult to speak about in a way that's respectful. So what I was saying before about, you know, you don't have to attack people if you feel strongly about something. You don't have to um, put people down and insult people. You can still communicate passionately um, and empathetically without being aggressive um, and disrespectful. You know, when you spoke on the TED Talk and, you, and, you know, the social fear of being humiliated, being judged, being uh, resented, how do you think, what would be your advice to people out there that are watching us today mm -hmm. to overcome this kind of fears? Because it all comes to one word, fear, fear That's of rejection. Right. Um, I think we all live with fear of social consequences, no matter how brave we are. Um, it's something that we all, especially me, like, you know, I've had to work with it a lot. Um, I don't think there's any escaping the fear. We just have to learn to build the skills and practice yeah. um, facing that fear again mm -hmm. and again until we get better at it. And one of the tips that I gave during my TED talk was, you know, if you feel really strongly about something but you're scared to tell the whole world, you don't have to start by telling the whole world and doing a TED talk or, you know, doing a, a Facebook live broadcast about how you feel. Start by telling one person. It could be your best friend. For my mum, it was telling her doctor and I see it as she told me, you know, mm -hmm. she felt comfortable sharing that with me. She started by sharing her ideas and sharing her beliefs and her passion with a small group of people. And um, the thing about social courage is that it's contagious. And so you only need to share it with a few people. And if it really catches on and it resonates with the people around you, it will spread on its own. Belinda, who are your heroes? Or who were your heroes before Brave Walk? And who are your heroes after Brave Walk? Before Brave Walk, well, my mum's an obvious one. Um, actually, I'm going to say my dad. My dad is one of my heroes. Um, he always taught me that you should do things in your life that make you happy. I remember um, growing up, my mum would always say, like, you know, I'd say to mum, what do you want me to be when I grow up? Because, you know, when you're a kid, you seek approval from your parents. And my mum would always say, oh, you have to be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. And she, she loved me, but, you know, she'd always say things like that. And then I'd ask my dad the same thing. Dad, what do you want me to be when I grow up? And he's like, I just want you to be happy. Um, and I think, you know, the walk wasn't a happy thing in itself, but it was something that brought me a lot of joy throughout that process. And um, I think... If you're going to be a force of change in the world or an agent of change in the world, 
um, you have to do something that brings you a level of enjoyment and joy and happiness as well. Um, of course, the, the context is always going to be different for me. It was voluntary assisted dying for you and something else. Um, but I think that's something, yeah, my dad's my hero because there's not a lot of people who really champion that, I feel, sometimes in today's world. Um, we have to remember that in all the sadness and the tragedy and the panic and the hysteria about, you know, whatever it is that's going on in the world, there's always going to be something bad going on in the world. We have to remember to find happiness as well. And that's how we can be the most effective um, agents for change. Where do you see Belinda in 10 years' time? I have no idea. <laughs> so much has changed uh, in the last 10 years. I would prefer not to think about it, to be honest. I'm always happy to, to speculate, but I think the journey that I've been on has just shown that if you just um, focus on being yourself, being authentic, being true to who you are, um, the most amazing things will happen. It's when you, for me, things never work out for me when I try to plan or try to say that things will go one way or another. Um, I think life is beautiful when you allow it to unfold the way it's supposed to. If I were to give you now a magic wand, yeah. and you have two wishes. Okay. One for the world and one for yourself. Uh, what would be your two wishes? Oh and goodness. you have a minute to make it happen, to say it loud. Oh my goodness. A wish for the world. I... No, I'll start, I'll start with the easy one. A wish for myself. Ah, oh, it's so hard. Um, okay, actually, I've got, I've got one for the world. I wish that Jacinda Ardern could just be the Prime Minister of the whole world. I'm a big fan. Yes. Um, I think she's amazing. I, I think that she leads with a lot of moral courage, a lot of social courage. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's something I would change about the whole world. Uh, as for myself, I would really like to be able to cook all the dishes that my mum used to cook. <laughs> well, I think this wish can come true. Yes. Yeah. Linda, I, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much you for, for having being me. a guest on my show. Thank you. And I wish you all the best. And we like to, I'm going to hear in the future about your future walks, because I believe that when you start walking, you don't stop. That's absolutely correct. Thank you. Thank you so much.